so good morning. This is the uh, master's orientation uh, for, for incoming fall 2021 from the Graduate Department of Public Health Sciences. Uh, first, I'd like to read our land acknowledgement. Uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to work on this land together. Uh, so the first slide I have here uh, looks kind of busy. Um, it is just a listing of uh, important upcoming dates and deadlines. Uh, and these are posted on our website in various locations on our information for incoming students page, and as well uh, on our times tables page, we have also a, a page, a link to a page with important dates and deadlines, but this is just sort of a one stop uh, sheet for you to refer to. Um, you are able to activate, activate your UTOR ID uh, anytime right away. Um, the registration deadline, fall 20, uh, February, sorry, Friday, August 27th, uh, and that gives plenty of time for payments to be received when you make a payment through a bank, you know, in the transactions and the university to receive and record your payment by the registration deadline of September 10th. Uh, so it's about, it's two weeks, it's 10 full business days. It probably doesn't take quite that long, but uh, the university does recommend that you make your fee payments early to ensure that you are registered by the deadline. Uh, after that date, there would be uh, late registration fees charged. After the initial payment is made, anybody who has not been able to pay the full uh, amount of the fall session fees uh, should try to do that before the end of September. After September 30, uh, the university will start to charge out, uh, some service charges on outstanding fall session fees. Uh, so that's the first deadline. And then again, there is a separate deadline for the winter uh, session fees that I haven't indicated here. Uh, so initially your fall session fees are due and then the winter session fees later. So coming up uh, shortly on August 4th, our online course enrollment will begin. Every graduate unit has, uh, uh, has the ability to set their own dates, but in public health sciences, we uh, will have our courses available for students to select starting Wednesday, August 4th. And then the deadline to have made all your course enrollment choices is Monday, September 20th. For um, pretty much all of our classes uh, across graduate studies, in fact, the first day of classes is Tuesday, September 7th. Um, so during that week, first classes will begin, except for our bioethics students. Uh, if any of you are joining us this morning, they are on a two week rotation and the first year students uh, are starting in the second week of classes. So that will be Thursday, September 16th. So here up top as well is a link, uh, as I mentioned to that session of dates and deadlines page, which is found on our timetables page. Okay, so this is a screenshot of our homepage uh, in the Department of Public Health Sciences. And on that homepage, I have uh, shown uh, an arrow here to the information for incoming students page. This is the page that was referenced in the welcome letter that you would have recently received. Uh, and this is a direct link to it up at the top. And on that page, there's a whole variety of information. Uh, so the first thing you need to do when you are uh, planning to study in September is to get your University of Toronto student card, which we call the T-card. Uh, as it says here, it's your student ID, it's a library card, um, you know, it has other functions. I think you can load money on it and, and pay for certain things around campus uh, when in fact we are back on campus. Uh, so it's an important piece of ID and everybody must have ultimately uh, a T-card. Right now, the process for obtaining your T-card is, like most things, a remote process. Uh, you can log on to uh, get the information at the T-card office website. You'll need to upload a photo of yourself, and there's instructions on how to do that and, and where. Uh, and then you will make an appointment with somebody to meet uh, on, in an online format uh, to verify your um, identity and your status in Canada. 
and uh, they will uh, give you the information to, to uh, allow you to activate your UTOR ID. Um, and then you'll be able to get your University of Toronto email address and log into various university systems. Until you're able to get your, uh, make your T-card appointment and, and get that UTOR ID activation code, you would be able to convert your JOIN ID, which you receive uh, when you receive an offer of admission, uh, to the UTOR ID. And I have information on our website uh, about how to do that as well. Steps to sort of activate your JOIN ID in the interim while you are uh, arranging to receive your T-card. So the information on the T-card website now suggests that they will be making appointments on campus for people to be able to come in and actually pick up their um, hard copy T-card. Uh, so they didn't do that last year at all. Everybody was studying remote and all the new students uh, had just a, um, you know, activated their T-card but didn't have one in person. But I think this year they are planning to do that as well. So, uh, but in the interim, it's the photo uh, and the virtual remote activation process. Um, so the next thing you'll need to do is visit ACORN. Uh, ACORN is an online interface uh, where students access all of the data that's, you know, associated with their student records. Uh, here in the graduate office, we access uh, our own end and we call it ROSI. So ROSI is the repository of student information. It's all the data for all the students uh, in, a, in a massive database um, that we work on and the students access their information through uh, a web-based interface called ACORN. So we encourage you at this point to log into ACORN and familiarize yourself with some of the functions uh, within. Uh, that's where you will view your invoices, um, where you will add and drop courses, uh, you can view your transcripts, you know, in your academic history later on when your grades uh, from your courses are made available. Um, you will, uh, I think I have a list here, yeah. So there's all kinds of things here that you can be doing. Uh, we highly recommend that students enter bank details. There is a function there where you can enter in your banking information and then any students who are receiving, you know, refunds or award payments or prizes or bursary funds, whatever, it would be paid to them uh, via direct deposit right into their bank account instead of having the university have to prepare a check and put the check in the mail and it just takes so much longer. So um, that is something we encourage. And as well, it's very, very important for you to have your contact information up to date. Um, you must put in your University of Toronto email address once you have received that. Uh, because that is the only way that the university will communicate with students. Uh, that is the only way we can guarantee that we are communicating with the correct person is by uh, using your university issued email address. So you must update in ACORN your email address, but as well it's important to have your mailing address. There, there are two types, there's a permanent address and a mailing address uh, in ACORN and your mailing address has to be up to date and current. Uh, the, the addresses have expiry dates. Um, so if you've been studying at you know, Western University an undergraduate and you're gonna be living there until the end of August, you know, that might be the date that is currently in ACORN because that was the, what you had entered into your online application. So your online application information was pulled into ROSI uh, and that's what you'll see in and uh, dates that are expired uh, ultimately could cause issues for students, for example, who are receiving uh, award or bursary payments. So it's important to have a correct mailing address that is not expired uh, in ROSI. Okay, so that's ACORN. Uh, this is a screenshot of ACORN. I believe this is the dashboard. So you'll see on the left-hand side, a couple of headings, academics, uh, it's a little bit small, let me see if I can make it bigger. Uh, enrolling in courses, viewing your timetable, uh, viewing your academic history and whatnot, finances, there's a couple of uh, selections there, uh, and then life, student life. Uh, so there is 
uh, those are links to other sites around the university uh, that you may uh, be interested in visiting. So on the, on the dashboard page, you'll see your status here of uh, this green text. Uh, this one says registered here. And then underneath it says invited. This is just an example I had pulled. So everybody at this point uh, should have the status invited. Uh, that's because the, you know, you're, you're just invited to start in this academic year. Uh, fees, I think, have actually just been assessed today. So people will start to be able to see their uh, tuition fees on their accounts uh, as of today, is my understanding. And once you have been able to make a fee payment or if you're eligible to defer your fee payment, this status invited will change to registered. So when I talked earlier about a registration deadline, uh, that is uh, what I'm talking about, is the need to have deferred or paid some or all of your uh, fall term tuition fees so that your status moves from invited to registered. Okay. So becoming registered. Uh, as I just mentioned, there are uh, a couple of ways that can do that. Most commonly uh, is that students will uh, need to make a fee payment. Uh, fee payments are made through your financial institution. So the university, you know, our office, the student accounts office, that they don't take uh, tuition payments at all. You have to pay through your bank, um, just as if you're paying any other bill. Um, there's all kinds of information on the student accounts website about that. So if you can log into ACORN, you can view your invoice, you can uh, print, you know, download, probably print a copy of it uh, and, you know, take that to the bank if you, if you like. Um, in the top corner, in the top right hand corner, you'll see what is your account number uh, and generally it is the first five letters of your last name followed by your full student number. So that is your account number. Uh, and you, the payee would be University of Toronto. So if you're setting up a bill payment, you know, an online banking, um, University of Toronto's payee, and that would be your account number. And you can do that as well. Uh, there are, uh, students may be able to defer their tuition payments uh, if they're receiving OSAP. So you must already have confirmed uh, OSAP assessment that, you know, that, that you will be receiving OSAP and the university has to have received that information as well uh, through our enrollment services office. And once that information has been received, you will be able to, you will be able to go into ACORN in, in this screen in the financial account. Uh, if you click under there, I, maybe I have another, uh, yeah, here, if you click in the finances menu, there's a function called tuition fee deferral. And if you are eligible to defer your tuition fees, that function will be available for you. And what that means is, is that your status will move from invited to registered without uh, having, without you having had to make a fee payment. So it's sort of a temporary uh, deferral, it allows you to become registered. And then I understand now that actually OSAP payments will go directly toward your tuition fees. So you won't get the OSAP necessarily, or you might get part of it, depending on, you know, how much OSAP you're receiving and what your, what your fees are. Um, but there will be payments made toward your fees. And if you do receive the whole of the OSAP, then you need to make uh, OSAP, uh, a tuition fee payment, uh, again, probably before the September 30 deadline because the OSAP fee deferral is limited. Um, so it, it allows you to become registered, but if, you're, if payments haven't been made, you will start to accrue service charges. Um, students who are receiving uh, awards like OGS, um, or there might be a couple, maybe not this year, but in year two, we have students uh, who are receiving CIHR or SHRC uh, CGSM awards. And those award payments, actually uh, deferrals, will allow students to defer their fees for longer uh, throughout uh, a greater portion of the 
academic year, which means that your pain, your tuition payments uh, can be made even later or spread out throughout the term and you don't uh, accrue service charges. So the, the, the tuition fee deferral is about getting your status moved to registered and in some cases, uh, as with you know, external awards, uh, you may be able to defer uh, service charge fees, uh, service charges accruing uh, when you defer your tuition payments. Uh, but obviously the tuition doesn't go away. Um, the tuition will always be there uh, waiting to be paid and you will get reminders periodically, even if you've, you know, even if you've got a, an award and you deferred your fees uh, until April, you'll still get reminders to make tuition fee payments. Okay, so was there anything else here? Uh, yeah, so that's just about awards, so payments deferrals and awards. And depending on the award, uh, we have a number of internal awards. Uh, many of you, I hope, have applied. And some of those need-based awards often will be directed, the payments will be directed to your outstanding tuition fees and other types of awards. Uh, the September payments are paid directly to students. So it depends a little bit on, uh, on the award and, and how much is the award, if it's being paid all at once or if it's being paid in installments. Uh, but there is information on our website as well about uh, different types of awards. And any award, when you receive an award, generally in an award notice, it should give you some idea about uh, how the payments are being made and when so that's so now you've got your t card and you've activated your utar id and you've been in acorn and and uh, familiarize yourself with that a little bit and the next thing you'll need to think about is enrolling in your courses uh, as i mentioned august 4th is when our courses open courses in public health sciences uh, generally speaking incoming students uh, aren't necessarily taking courses in the fall term from, from other graduate units, but if you're interested in now or in the future, uh, you would need to look at the information on their websites, uh, in their timetables to see you know, when those courses will be available. Um, uh, so, you know, and if you have friends who are in other departments and they've already enrolled in all their courses, you know, that's no need for you to get worried that you've missed something because uh, our course enrollment opens on August 4th. Uh, so all our incoming master students, um, except, sorry, not bioethics, so the MPH, MSc Biostatistics, and our MSc CH uh, degree program students will be enrolled in our Introduction to Public Health Sciences course, uh, and that should already appear uh, in your course enrollment listing. Um, if it doesn't, you can reach out to the graduate office just to let us know because uh, it, should, uh, it should be there for every incoming student. Um, you should review uh, the timetables. The fall and the winter timetables are posted now. Uh, and uh, I, as well, I have a link here to a course database, uh, which is a, a larger listing of all of our courses. They're not all offered every term or every academic year, uh, but if something seems to be missing, you wanna maybe browse through the course database uh, to see if there's another course of interest and, and maybe find out if or when it's going to be offered. Uh, so those are two uh, links you can go to to look at the course offerings. Uh, you will have an opportunity early in September to meet with your program uh, and your program director and other faculty and, and perhaps current students in the program and uh, you will then probably talk about what your required course enrollments and you know popular electives or whatnot will be for your program uh, and how and when you should be enrolling in those. Uh, as well, there is a for most, I think for most programs, MPH, MSC, and MSCCH, there should be a listing on the program page for your degree program and your field of study. Generally, we have uh, uh, the program requirements listed out in sort of examples, term one, term two, terms three, you know, generally the order in which students are taking courses. So that's available on our website as well. Uh, there is a function in ACORN that lets students add courses to their enrollment cart. 
And this is a way for students to be planning. Uh, so you could go in now, even before our course enrollment begins, and you can select your courses and see what your timetable is going to look like uh, and move them all into your enrollment cart. Courses in your enrollment cart will not automatically become enrolled when our enrollment date opens on August 4th. You will still actually have to go back into ACORN and from your enrollment cart, click enroll, enroll, enroll for each course to actually uh, put your request into enroll. So the enrollment cart is just sort of a planning tool for you. It is not how you enroll in courses uh, directly. You have to move them from your enrollment cart. Okay. Um, generally, your requests are approved when you add them. There may be some courses where an enrollment, uh, when you click on it, is just a request, which means that somebody in the graduate office uh, needs to approve that request. And that would typically happen if you're enrolling in a course from another graduate unit. So any PHS course that you enroll in, uh, you should be improved. If you got in, you have a space and it's approved. Uh, if you're enrolling in a course from another graduate unit, uh, you may get a message that it's a course request. So we know that and we, we log into our side, our end of Rosie, uh, during the whole course enrollment process, periodically checking for those course requests and we will approve them uh, or we may you know, contact you or inquire about a particular course. Sometimes we might seek permission from the program director. You know, we'll just send them a message, say, hey, one of your students is enrolling in this nursing course. Do you think that's relevant? And they'll say, yes, sure, that sounds fine. And then we'll approve it. So only if there's an issue, we would contact you uh, to inquire as to why you have selected that course. So there isn't really any need for students to contact the graduate office to say, hey, I got a request. I enrolled in a course and it says that I got a request that needs to be approved. We know that. That's how the system works. And we check regularly throughout the course enrollment period for course requests. And we go through them and we make approvals. So don't uh, get concerned about getting that kind of a message. That is uh, uh, an approved process of the course enrollment. And once your courses are approved, either automatically when you have added your PHS courses or when we've approved external courses, only at that point will you be able to see those courses in Quercus, which is our uh, learning management tool. Um, so there may be a lag time in some courses where you've requested it and then you don't see it in Quercus yet uh, and maybe it's still waiting for approval. And is there anything else here? Yeah. So when you're interested in taking a course from another department, uh, we do recommend that you try to add it in ACORN and you may just get, you know, a message that says, you know, there's no space for you. There's no space for your, for your enrollment category, it might say. Um, so if you're an MPH epidemiology student and the course has been sort of limited to HBS uh, social and behavioral health science students, you know, because that's a big class and, and the instructor may want to just manage uh, course enrollments of, of non-SBHS students. So you may get an error message that there's no space for your enrollment limit. And certainly if you're looking at a course in an outside department, uh, other departments often sort of limit their course enrollment to students in their own program. But we ask you to try because there are a number of courses that will, you know, are open to all graduate students across. Uh, and if you, but if you can't get in, then you should probably uh, visit the that graduate unit's um, website and their timetable and see if you can find information about what their process is. Generally, you'll need permission from the instructor of that course, and often you will need to uh, complete an add drop form. Uh, which I have linked here, and there are various signatures that are required on that form. Um, so those are, but to start in September, most of you will, will likely only be taking uh, public health science courses, and that shouldn't be an issue. So this is a login screen for, I have here login to Quercus, but actually this is a typical 
uh, log in to many of the University of Toronto uh, systems. If you're logging into internet somewhere, if you're logging into Acorn, maybe it even looks the same. Um, so this is the UTOR ID password login page, and that will get you into Quirkus ultimately. And this is uh, an empty Quirkus dashboard, but once you have uh, enrolled in and been approved in all your courses, you'll see them all listed uh, across that white space. And then you would click into your course and, and you'd get all the information there that uh, the instructors have put. So they have their announcements, probably, uh, hopefully the course syllabus is in there and, you know, all the other instructions, information, readings, whatnot is in Quirkus. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to talk about briefly, I can see there's been lots of activity in the chat, so we'll get to that. Um, I just find it personally myself a little bit easier to sort of kind of go through everything uh, and then we'll stop for questions rather than breaking up. So the last thing I want to talk about is funding opportunities. Uh, we had a number of awards that were uh, advertised sort of May, June. I think the, the application deadline has passed just earlier in July. So we're working on uh, those uh, and, and, and many of those were available for incoming students as well. Um, we do, so throughout the academic year, and if you're here for more than one year, uh, you will receive uh, email through our student listserv when new awards are being, you know, when we're accepting applications for new awards with all the information, the eligibility and um, you know, the amounts and all that stuff um, will be sent. And as well, we post those awards on our website. We have a student award and funding opportunities page. So that's where you will find many of the, uh, sometimes not all of them are posted, like external awards that maybe the awards officer just feels are of interest to students. She'll disseminate them through the listserv, but uh, they might not all get posted, but Anyway, the big ones and certainly our internal are, are posted on our website. So this is one of the reasons why it's very important for you to update your university issued email address in ACORN. Uh, because by mid, you know, second, third week in September, uh, I will download the class list, the uh, incoming cohort from uh, Rosie and to create the student listserv and only UToronto, mail.utoronto email address will be included in the listserv. Okay, we will not communicate uh, through our listserv to students who have anything other than a university issued email address. Uh, you can redirect your University of Toronto email address to an email that you prefer perhaps, but uh, the communication, and likewise, when you contact the graduate office for any reason, uh, you should communicate to us through your University of Toronto email address. Okay, so there, so awards, um, we just finished a big announcement. They're being adjudicated throughout the year. Uh, awards are announced to students and they're posted on our webpage. And then the School of Graduate Studies has quite a comprehensive list as well of uh, their awards and common awards uh, that our students apply to, uh, external awards, government funded, provincial and, and federal awards and awards for international students. Uh, as well, I'll post it on the funding opportunities page. Okay, so, okay, here's the last thing I want to talk about is the Public Health Student Association. Uh, they are a fairly active group. Uh, they have a page on our website as well, and that will list uh, the members of the uh, association this year, the executive committee, uh, and if they post events and whatnot that they are um, hosting throughout the year, they have meetings generally monthly, I think, Diane, you could nod, are they monthly meetings? Yeah. Um, uh, if you're interested in getting involved in any, uh, uh, any of that type of activities, uh, you will hear, you will be hearing from the PHSA, I'm sure, during uh, the orientation. Uh, we're having an orientation day on September 2nd. They, they're planning things, I think, throughout the week. Again, Diane, I don't know if you have anything more to say. About that yeah so we're waiting for some finalizing uh, but they do have some some activities planned for incoming students and anything else okay so in the fall 
um, what to expect. Uh, there's information is posted on this link here, updates uh, on COVID-19 from the Dalaran School of Public Health. Anything that's new or changing uh, is, will be posted there. Uh, and as well, the University of Toronto and the School of Graduate Studies have similar type information pages uh, if anything is changing. We have uh, made an announcement uh, just at the end of May, May 31st, our Dean Staney Brown announced that in fact, our fall session courses will be delivered remotely again um, while we transition, while we work to uh, figure out how a more, you know, in-person activities will take place. Uh, there are a handful of courses that will be having some in-person components um, and you will be informed uh, through uh, information that we've listed on the timetable about course delivery uh, and through your program directors uh, or perhaps even course instructors about how that is all going to play out. Um, and I put here a couple of links for international students. Uh, the Center for International Experience is sort of the university's um, hub for uh, information, programming, um, resources for, for international students. And they have a group of uh, immigration advisors as well who can uh, work with students, answer their questions uh, if they're having any issues or um, anything around, you know, getting study permits, travel papers, you know, arriving in Canada, uh, things like that, uh, if they have an immigration advisor. So I think that is, oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, and then this is just a listing of uh, contacts. So in the graduate office, uh, our graduate coordinator is Professor Ali Sorella. He is a biostatistics professor uh, in our biostatistics division, and he acts as the graduate coordinator, sort of overseeing, um, you know, any student related uh, topics for all of our students, masters and PhD. Um, again, my name is Ellen. I'm graduate program administra administrator. Uh, Vanita Krishnan is a graduate assistant, and she manages uh, all the awards in the office. So she sends out the award announcements. She generally is the person who receives uh, the applications that are coming directly into the graduate office. And she will answer any questions people have about uh, those awards. And Vanessa and Diana Whitney uh, are graduate assistants also in the office. Diana Whitney, as I mentioned, are joining us today here. And they have their University of Toronto, Dalaran School of Public Health background. So if you can see them, that's how you can identify. And then each program uh, field of study sort of has an administrative um, assistant as well. So the, the, the program director is the faculty who leads the program and they have sort of an administrative staff member. 